Good evening. First Kings chapter 21. We're going to talk this evening under the heading of Be Sure Your Sin Will Find You Out. Which certainly is a familiar verse from Numbers 32.23. If you'll remember when Moses made that statement to Gad and Reuben. He was talking about their responsibility to go and fight with their brethren before they went to their possession. And had they failed their duty, Moses wanted them to know, be sure your sin will find you out. And likewise, God is all seeing, all knowing, there is nothing that escapes His sight. So we're going to pick up our study of the life of the prophet Elijah. We're going to look at Elijah going back now and dealing once again with King Ahab of Israel. It's interesting to note that the text before us in 1 Kings 21, 17, and we'll just go through the end of the chapter really here, takes place uh, at least six years after the events we talked about this morning. And that was a wonderful message that Elijah received that he would go and anoint a new king in Israel. And here it is six years later. And Ahab is still the vassal puppet king sitting on the throne. God is going to deal with Ahab in his own time. The sentence had already been handed out. Let's begin in verse 17. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. God knew exactly where Ahab was and what he had been doing. Now we'll talk about the mission being described. And then in the latter part of the sermon this evening, we'll talk about the mission as it was declared. That is, as Elijah declared the message God gave him to Ahab. What happened during those five or six years. We don't know. That old favorite verse often comes to mind that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. We don't know what happened during those intervening years in the life of Elijah. Was he out working with Elisha? Training Elisha to take over in his stead one day? Was it a time of training this man in a similar fashion to the training of Elijah? We, we just don't know what happened. But it does bring questions to my mind at least. You know, Elijah, when you come right down to it, and if you are honest, he made a terrible mistake. We know there were circumstances involved. The fatigue and these other things, but the fact of the matter remains that he made a terrible mistake. And I do wonder if he were given to thoughts at times. Did he question whether or not God was going to shelf him? Was his work as a prophet in Israel expired? And I wonder if we at times feel like that. Times that we have forsaken our duty, our responsibility in the kingdom of Christ. I wonder if Jonah, while in the whale's belly, and it was a whale's belly, a literal event, but did he think that he had preached his last sermon? I find it interesting to think about different things. Maybe a lot of people don't think about these things, but I do. 
Can you imagine what the digestive juices of that big fish did to his skin? It probably bleached him as white as white can be from head to toe. And I wonder what impact that had on the Ninevites when he walked through their streets preaching again 40 days, you better turn or burn. I imagine he got their attention. I wonder at times, did Peter think he was all washed up when he was warming his hands there by a Roman fire? Did John Mark walk away that day thinking that the Apostle Paul would never ever trust him again? Did David ever think that he would be able to sing and shout for joy again because of the salvation of the Lord when he transgressed with Bathsheba, murdered her husband Uriah the Hittite in an attempt to cover up his wickedness? But alas, this is the God we serve. The God of second chances. The God of multiple chances. The God who wants our hearts. That's all He wants. He wants us to give ourselves completely to Him. And Elijah, Elijah, why he's not shelved. It's time to go back to work. And so he was to arise and to go meet Ahab, king of Israel. God knew exactly where Ahab was. God knew what Ahab had been involved in. He knew how Ahab and Jezebel, mainly Jezebel, working Ahab like a puppet, conspired to take the property that belonged to Naboth, Naboth his vineyard, and they took his life. And God said, you know what? This is enough. Sometimes I think as mortals, we think that the wheels of God's justice just turn so slowly. They do. They turn slowly, but friends, remember that they grind exceedingly fine. They don't miss a thing. There is a time a time of harvest. Galatians 6, 9 sets forth that principle, doesn't it? There is a time coming when all accounts are payable. And we ought to be sure that our sin, it will find us out. So why would a man or a woman ever want to hide sin and think they can just get by? How many are guilty of creating God in the image of man? That's not how it happened. God created man in His own image, but a lot of people think God is just like they are. And that God will overlook and excuse that He's like that mama in the supermarket. You know the one I'm talking about. Every time you run across her, her child's into this or that, and she says, if you don't quit it, I'm going to spank you. And you go around the corner, and there he is again laughing at his mom because she's not about to lift a finger to spank him. Why? He'll probably call 911 on her. God's not like that. God means business. There is nothing that is hidden from the sight of our God. And there is... That time when accounts, why they become payable, there are limitations to the mercy of God. In the Greek, there is a word, pharonai. And it describes the unyielding, the unbending nature of God. And Paul used that word to describe what God did to Christ in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. That He spared not His only begotten Son. There was no other plan. When Jesus 
when his sweat became, as it were, drops of blood there in the garden, there is the humanity realizing how terrible that's going to be on the cross. And is there another way? He says to the Father. And the Father says, there isn't any other way. If man is to be saved, someone has to die. Someone has to pay the penalty. After all, God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And God meant it. And He was able to look over those times. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Romans 3, 25 through 27. And he, what he was doing was looking to the cross. And every person who has an extension on life has it because of Christ. Because of His willingness to die. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when we violate the Master's holiness, we actually forfeit our right to live. And it's through the good grace of Christ that we can go on. And that ought to help us better understand passages that teach, for ye have been bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Verse 18. How wonderful and marvelous is the grace of God, but there are those limits that He put in place. And God will not go beyond those boundaries. He will not bend. He will not yield. And Ahab is going to get a lesson on that. And thus, the prophet is commissioned. And so we read further. God says in 19, Thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed, and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. There is... Absolutely no misunderstanding this message. Think about it. How many times, I'm sure you don't have that problem here, but maybe you can think around to other places. How many times do people leave the meeting house wondering what that preacher was saying anyway? You know, he went all around that thing. He snuck up behind it. He climbed over the top of it. He did everything he could but hit it right on the nail. But as Elijah goes and delivers the message, and the message begins unfolding, there isn't going to be any misunderstanding of this message. And really, that's the way God wants it preached. That's the way God wants it taught. Oh, I've heard it. And so have you. We've got the milk of the Word of God and the meat of the Word of God and you just don't feed a babe that meat. And so we're going to wait a year and that year turns into five years and pretty soon it's twenty years. And the brethren are dying of starvation. And please don't withhold anything from me that will cost me my soul. Tell me the truth. Feed it to me. If I have to pick out the bones, let me pick them out, but don't condemn my soul to hell because you don't want to lay out the message in a plain, simple way. You see, sometimes we just have to be so specific that we all get it. We've got to get it right down there where the calves can get it. It's got to be understandable. It's got to be plain and to the point. And then we'll turn to the 15th chapter of Proverbs. Notice the second verse. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Is it a wise thing to take the truth of God's Word and package it in such a way that you know it's not going to be understood and that's why you packaged it that way. 
because you didn't want to just come right out and say what needed to be said. Is that pouring out foolishness? And then in addition, notice this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Now, let's just tie this in with 2 Timothy 4. Remember where Paul told Timothy, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now let's go back up a little bit. I charge thee before. That little word means in the very presence of. In the presence of God. And I believe with all of my heart that if more preachers and more teachers understood what that meant, they would remove themselves from the foolishness of hiding God's Word and cloaking it so it can't be understood. We've got a wonderful message here. But then someone says, I don't want to make anybody mad. I don't, want to. I don't either. I think you have to be some kind of nuts to want to be involved in conflict and stirring people up. That's just not natural. It's not the way God created us. But likewise, sometimes we have to be able to grapple with that Word and that Word can make us upset and angry. And many times, that brings us around. Helps us to see clearly what we need to see. We can't hide the Word of God. We need to speak it and remember that God is everywhere in every place. And he saw what Ahab and Jezebel conspired. They're going to pay for their sin. In Mark's record, let's notice in the fourth chapter, verse 22. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. No one is ever going to pull one over on God. And in addition to that, there's a day coming when all things are going to be made known. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And Elijah is the best friend they have had. He really is. He's there because he loves God, because he loves Israel, because he wants to do God's will. He wants things to be righteous in Israel. And so he loves Ahab. And he brings God's Word to Ahab, and Ahab says, You're my enemy. There hasn't been any love lost between these two. Six years or so since they've seen each other. No love lost. You know, Paul would say to the fickle Galatians, So then am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16 And then even Jesus Christ to the Jews in that same context when He informed them that ye are of your father the devil. He likewise, uh, John 8.40, told the Jews that they sought to kill Him because He told them the truth. Now that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. In regard to delivering the message. You can't package it up. You have to deliver it the way God designed it to be delivered. The words are God's words. Do you want to know why we have so many modern versions, speech perversions of God's Word? 
Do you want to know why there are so many textual critics out there just butchering the Word of God? This doesn't belong. This isn't in the text. This isn't here. The reason is they do not see the Word as the very Word of God. They don't. This is the very Word of God. It is God communicating to man. If you think it's just ink on paper, you're missing it. The Word of God is living. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is alive. And in order to be right with God, that living Word has to be in our heart. It has to be His Word. And you cannot change it up. No man is smart enough to improve on what the divine gave the human. The Creator of man. We're not ever going to improve on His Word. It's got to be just as plain and simple as it can be. If it angers people, it angers them. If it helps them find salvation, it was worth it all. I don't ever want to go to the doctor and be told that I have some dreaded disease that's going to kill me. But if I need to be told that, I, I need to hear that just as quickly as I can so maybe that can be put into remission and give me a better quality of life. The greatest cancer ever known is sin. And the only way to put it in remission is through the shed blood of Christ and the only way to contact that blood is by learning the truth and obeying it Going through the waters of baptism and living faithful in His eyes. And you just have to have the truth to get all of that accomplished. It's a wonderful message. It's powerful. And you know, Elijah doesn't pull any punches. He tells it like it is. Behold, verse 21, I will bring evil upon thee and take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab all of his male children and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nabat, and like the house of Baasha the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. What a cruel way to go. To be eaten by dogs. It's a horrible way for one to die. To be taken care of there. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field, shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sail himself to work wickedness, in the sight of the Lord whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. This is the second time we're told this about Ahab selling himself. He sold out. This is a word I'm told in the original that would be used to describe a couple entering into marriage. But more often it's being used to describe someone being sold into slavery in the Hebrew. And that certainly brings to mind the sixth chapter of Romans. Know ye not, says Paul, verse 16. This is something you need to know. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. How do they think that we're saved by grace only? How do they get this idea that we're saved by faith only? Without conforming to the Word of God, without having to obey some kind of standard? I'll tell you how they get it. They get it outside of the Scriptures. Because they're obviously not reading stuff like this. We're going to sell ourselves out. Either to God through obedience to His truth, or to the devil 
by obeying His will. And it is a choice that every person makes. Ahab made the choice. He's not going to be able to blame Jezebel and he didn't even try. Elijah nailed him down too fast for that. He made it absolutely clear that Naboth was dead because of Ahab. That's right. Because he sold himself out. He sold himself into sin. And he did, verse 26, very abominable in following idols according to all things, as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And do you remember that it would be generations before the Hebrews could possess the land of promise? Because, as God said, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. They feel their iniquity. And God's mercy interceded and He sent the Hebrews to destroy them. Ahab and Jezebel's cup of iniquity is full. It's overflowing. And it is the merciful God, the benevolent God, the loving God, the just God we serve that said this is enough. And it came to pass, 27, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sack, sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. That is, he is tiptoeing around, pouting, mourning, because of the message he heard. What is repentance? In the Greek, the word translated repentance is a compound word that literally means change the mind. That's what repentance is. Simply changing one's mind. But with repentance, the kind of repentance that is unto salvation, there is always attached to it a change of life, a change of direction. If you could visualize this, you might think about walking toward the broad way leading to destruction and then making a decision to change your mind about that direction. And there, there is the 180 degree turn and you start going toward the narrow way leading unto life and godliness. That's repentance. The words, I'm sorry, are not repentance. They are not. You know, there are people who are sorry about a lot of things. And they wouldn't think about repenting not for one moment. For a number of years, I worked in a prison ministry, weekly going into the inmates and working among them. Strange that nobody ever does anything to get put in that place. It's strange that everybody's innocent and being picked on, but there are some who really regret their situation and what they did. And I know many. I can visualize their faces as I'm speaking to you. Many who are really sorry about what they did, but they wouldn't repent. I don't know what could get them to repent. Saying, I'm, so, you know, they're sorry that they're in prison. They're sorry that their life had so drastically and dramatically changed. But there are a few who are sorry over the fact that they violate the Master's holiness. And that's what it takes to move to the mind change, to change directions, to live in godliness before Him. That's what repentance is. Sometimes, in some places where I've been at least, you inevitably find maybe one, maybe two, who at least twice a month make their way down the aisle to confess just a number of things that the brethren didn't know about anyway. 
And that I don't understand, but week after week, week after week, sometimes I wonder if we just need to say, go get the world out of yourself. Because if you're going to be a Christian in the kingdom of Christ, you need to give yourself over to the Master's cause. You need to go ahead and make that commitment. You need to go ahead and change your mind. And change your life. I'm reminded of a story I heard once on the Isle of Haiti. About a man who wanted to sell his house. Have you heard this story? He asked $2,000 for it. There was a poor man who wanted it desperately. And they negotiated and negotiated. And finally, $1,000 is all the man could pay. And so the owner of the house said, I'll sell it to you. Everything except this nail hanging outside of the doorpost. And they agreed. The man went away for several years. He came back and wanted the house back. But the new owner would not sell it to him. He tried and tried to get it to get him to sell it. He wouldn't do it. So the old owner went and found a carcass of a dead dog and hung it on his nail. And after a period of time, he had his house back. If you leave a peg in your heart for Satan, you better be sure that he's going to come back and hang his trash in your life. He's going to take you right back into damnation. You have to make the decision to give your heart to God, to turn that life around. So I've read and read about this passage. I can go and read these fellows who say this isn't repentance, and I'll read these fellows who are saying it's repentance. I still haven't made up my mind. But I know this, whatever it was, it didn't take. It didn't last. He's awful sorry, no doubt. I would be too if the prophet of God who I knew to tell the truth came and told me I'm going to wipe you out. That's what God says for you and your family, your offspring. All of you are going to be wiped out. I think I'd walk around softly for a while too and rip my clothes. But I know this man didn't change his heart. Look in the next chapter, verse 8 of chapter 22. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet, yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. He didn't change. Here's another prophet of God. He doesn't want to hear what he has to say. He hates him because he comes with the truth and you cannot hate the truth and love the Master. You can't do it. You can't separate him from his message. Jesus said it like this, He that rejecteth Me and receiveth not My word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. You can't escape it. If you don't love the truth, you cannot love the King. This man, whatever happened, it didn't take. But I hope and pray that when we are We'll truly repent and that it'll take. We can go on to heaven and enjoy the fruit of eternal life in the after a while. Look at this man we've talked about, Elijah. We've talked about his victories and his defeat, his discouragement, and we've made some comparisons. We've compared him with Obadiah. You know the hireling, the one full of lip service? Well, let's compare him with Ahab. Elijah made a mistake, and he got up and he went back to work. And he's faithful. And it looks like next Sunday we're going to get to see what happens to him. 
He's going to be blessed. Ahab, why he gets to make a little drink there for the dogs. And his wife, she becomes Jezebel brand dog food. They didn't change. They are despicable in God's eyes. No, God loves them. He always loved them. They would not love God. And He has to be true to His holiness. So if there's anything you're getting from this series of sermons, I pray that you'll get this. The Master has to be true to His holiness. And He loves us enough to give us avenues whereby we can be with Him in that holiness. Whether it be through hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of our sins. And when we err, why, look at His mercy. Through confession, repentance, and prayer, we can be right back where we were. And God will never bring it up again. He's not like a man. You might be in a whale's belly. You might be turning your back on the Christ around a Roman fire. You might not have the stickability to continue on today. But if you'll get back up and work, you're going to be accepted in His eyes. If you have a need tonight to respond to the Lord's invitation, it's extended. Why don't you come this evening while we have time and opportunity, while we still have that privilege, you have a need for the Lord's invitation. Come now, so together we stand and sing. When we run with God.